Welcome everybody to the Channel Vision Magazine webinar featuring Packet Fabric, which is going to explain to us the differences between use cases for approaches to overlay and underlay networking. I'm your moderator, Bruce Christian, Senior Editor of Channel Vision Magazine. Our guest is Patrick Packet Fabric's Tech Lead for Strategy, otherwise known as Miracle Worker on Demand. We welcome Ken Gray. Hey, thank you, Bruce. Um, honored to be here and uh, happy to guide everybody through the evolution of uh, enterprise network architecture. Uh, without any delay, I think I'll just jump right in. Um, our agenda today is to explore that evolution, talk about underlay, overlay, how the internet and cloud adoption had, uh, affected that, some other topics like secure access, service edge, SD-WAN, and then a little bit about uh, the latency and performance and other topics that are associated with evolving enterprise network architectures. And if we get the time, um, I'll give you a little demo of what uh, network as a service looks like, which is at the top of that discussion. And then we'll have our wrap up and Q&A. Then any further ado, let's jump right in. So uh, I think everybody's familiar with it, with a drawing like this. Uh, we're showing you here the uh, network underlay, which is your physical and transport network, and an example of an overlay. Um, the underlay is essentially all the physical nodes, whether they're optical nodes or, or uh, switching nodes that do layer two forwarding or routing nodes. And the overlay is, is essentially a virtualization over top of that. There's two main distinctions here. Um, the underlay determines using the protocols that you see there, uh, the forwarding path of a packet or a flow in the network. And the overlay relies on the underlay, but it can't influence the uh, path of the packet. The second uh, implication between the two is in performance. The underlay essentially processes packets at line speed, and we're talking terabits per second um, to generate high throughput. An overlay can be offloaded to a hardware, hardware accelerator, but it can't begin to approach the performance of the underlay. In a traditional enterprise WAN, MPLS was used to create the underlay that connects the enterprise together. And the architecture was literally designed to create the impression that everything was connected to everything. And that's because enterprise IT kind of distributed everything throughout the enterprise network. Your applications ran on your desktop. There were uh, private data centers that were within your enterprise network. So you had that uh, feeling that everything was connected to everything else, uh, branches to branches, branches to data centers. In the traditional enterprise network architecture, there is also a little bit of a use of an overlay. And I think a lot of us are familiar with that. The typical use was for remote access to the private network. And that typically used the internet as an underlay and ran something like IPsec to an IPsec concentrator in a data center somewhere in the enterprise domain. That network architecture started to have a few problems when cloud came along. As enterprises started to digitally transform, they started to rely a lot on the cloud and the agility that the cloud provided them. The statistic that I'm showing you there is, is enterprises that have a hybrid or multi-cloud strategy. And it's essentially a saturation statistic. Just about everybody has a strategy. Adoption statistics are actually pretty high too. They're in the mid eighties now, 82 to 85% of enterprises already have multiple private and multiple public clouds. And those uh, statistics were provided from a Gartner survey. And you can see the quote from a Gartner analyst there on the right. And that is when we're planning our network architectures in the future, we're not planning on one future. We need to plan for multiple possible futures. Accommodating the move to using the cloud uh, to transform the enterprise uh, was a move to use software as a service, essentially change the way that enterprises uh, consumed applications and transform enterprise IT. And again, I'm showing you a couple of statistics here um, and they represent saturation statistics as well. 99% uh, of enterprises now use some form of SaaS. Uh, and you can see also that 
the average number of SaaS applications that an enterprise uses is actually uh, pretty high. And there's some quibbling over that number, but uh, it, generally speaking, the number of SaaS applications that an enterprise uses will track the size of the enterprise, the larger the enterprise, the more the applications. Slowly but surely, enterprise IT is converting on-premise software licenses to SaaS licenses. And SaaS vendors are encouraging by moving the consumption model to uh, uh, consumption on demand instead of seat licensing. There's a, a broad applicability now for software as a service in the enterprise. Um, broad applications like uh, your mail application and uh, UCAS or video conferencing like we're using today. And then very specialized vertical ones for different enterprise verticals. Um, Software as a service is one of the largest areas of public cloud spent. All of this is in the public cloud being delivered to the users in the enterprise. That created a, a problem for the traditional enterprise network architecture. Essentially, as more and more users in the enterprise started to try to use those cloud services, whether they were developed cloud applications by the enterprise itself or SaaS, they had to hairpin through a gateway, an internet gateway, normally in a data center somewhere inside of uh, the enterprise. And that led to some inefficiencies in network. And that led to the adoption of SD-WAN. SAS also and cloud uh, also required more bandwidth than you got typically to a, a branch office through an MPLS connection. So you can see here a telegeography survey about why people started adopting SD-WAN. And most of it is about increasing bandwidth to the sites at a lower cost than they got through MPLS. And doing it over the internet was essentially more responsive than working through their telco provider to get increased bandwidth through an MPLS connection. So early SD-WAN, uh, early stage SD-WAN deployments essentially perpetuized the existing enterprise architecture. You ended up with two underlays running to all the branches uh, and the SD-WAN overlay essentially tried to emulate the connectivity that you had uh, in the MPLS network. You, you would build sophisticated meshes where using your internet connection, you could connect anywhere inside of your enterprise. In some cases, it didn't solve the hairpinning problem because the SD-WAN hubs would be in enterprise data centers and would use the enterprise gateway uh, to get out to the internet. Over time, though, that started to break apart and the branches were allowed to go directly to the internet assets in the cloud. And that started to bring up a question of how that access would be secured. And then along came the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic just essentially finished shattering the old enterprise network architecture. Uh, before the pandemic, about 4% of all employees worked from home. You see the middle statistic there is uh, from a Gallup poll uh, that shows that 22% uh, of employees will remain working from home uh, in 2025. That's a, a huge change in the number of people working from home. The other poll is an Accenture Tanium poll, uh, and it shows the sentiment between employers and employees about some hybrid form of work, where hybrid means being in the office less than 80% of the time. You see that hybrid is heavily preferred and expected, essentially. And what this does to the enterprise network architecture is it creates a, an order of magnitude more network endpoints in the network, meaning that the old full mesh design of the enterprise network really can't hold, can't scale. Is that fully brought on the whole question of how are we going to secure this access if everything is going to the cloud? And that brought up, brought up the addition to SD-WAN of the secure access service edge, essentially providing a hop uh, in between the user and the cloud asset that provided security application on their flows. Again, it was all over the internet. Um, and that's not unusual when it comes to cloud environments. The first step just about every enterprise takes when they make their first virtual private cloud is through VPN connectivity or through a VPN gateway. 
shown here is really the first step connectivity diagrams for how you would access Amazon, but it's Amazon uh, cloud services, but it's no different for any of the other major cloud providers. Essentially VPN connectivity was the most common way to get from the enterprise domain, even if it was through an SD-WAN or a SASE concentrator into the public cloud. And we know that the internet, internet may not be as reliable or secure as a private underlay because it doesn't control the path. And so things can happen. But most people would think that the performance is about the same. And that really depends on the use case. When you look at it, the raw latency over the internet between any group of endpoints seems similar to that of a private underlay. And there's a reason for that. It's because there's just very few fiber routes in the world and we're all using the same fiber routes. So on the left, you see a thousand eyes cloud benchmark between a bunch of different endpoints uh, globally. And you can see on the right, uh, Packet Fabric's own SLA latency matrix between different endpoints on our network. They look the same. And it's really simply because of the speed of uh, light and glass is the limitation here for, for both types of deployments. But VPN encapsulation in, over the internet can impact uh, performance. And uh, essentially, uh, we've, we've shown that to some of our, our users and we have, I believe, uh, uh, a bunch of online demonstrations of this, as a matter of fact, a recipe of how to recreate this test. But what we did is we set up a connection between two public clouds and uh, used a Kafka pipeline essentially to demonstrate what the good put would be uh, or, or the amount of good throughput uh, for the application over similar types of connectivity. One being a, a connection over a VPN over the internet. And again, these two clouds are really highly paired with each other. So they're not going that far over the internet uh, to talk to each other and through our cloud router product uh, on Packet Fabric. The difference really was in uh, the VM to VM latency. So the VPN connection essentially added more latency and essentially more variable latency that affected the application itself. And that's why cloud providers actually offer direct connect or equivalent services. It's performance, the consistency of your performance first. The second reason is really around cost. At a certain point, particularly if you're egressing data out of a public cloud, it makes sense to move to a private connection. Uh, VPN egress data charges can be four to five times greater than private network egress data charges. And so at a certain point, uh, and it's not a very high amount of utilization, really. It makes sense to switch over to private for cost reasons. So the cloud core is essentially the idea of using private connectivity to collect, connect your cloud assets together in the steady state to increase performance. And of course, uh, through a network as a service offering with the agility that it provides, you can accommodate things like seasonality where you can turn up or turn down the bandwidth as you need it based on seasonal demand. And also to further enable innovation or to accommodate disruption as we go through the transformation of the enterprise to a digital enterprise. So you can reach out to new locations, new clouds, adopt new, applica new applications in the cloud with just the click of a button. Um, and if something came up like a merger or an acquisition, you can connect the networks together rather painlessly through a fabric like Packet Fabric. And the, the reason why network as a service came along, um, essentially SDN applied to networking or the network itself working as a cloud service is because of insufficiencies in traditional interconnection choices. With a traditional telco, because there was no agility, you essentially had to over-provision, which could lead to waste. Um, and on the internet, you had that problem that I illustrated with predictability and performance. Of course, there's some security issues, for instance, if the route changes to an undesirable route and transits an undesirable network. But it's not just for your cloud that you need this sort of agility. 
uh, as your network transforms, your backbone is going to change too. The former architecture that connected all of the endpoints together is now looking at connecting all those endpoints to the cloud. Your primary connections are going to be between private data centers, which can be on a fabric like packet fabric and controlled by network as a service agility. The aggregation points as well for all of those tunnels uh, can be connected to the same fabric. And that allows you to provide all of your users low latency uh, and to accommodate uh, things like data gravity problems as data moves from one data center to another, um, or as your workloads need to move to be more proximal to your, your data, you can accommodate that simply by resizing and reconfiguring your network. So you get privacy and resi resiliency without compromising agility when you use something like network as a service. Essentially with network as a service, the WAN becomes a cloud service as I mentioned before. You get on-demand provisioning, you get any-to-any -any connectivity, you get elastic consumption. It's a different way of consuming your network instead of phone calls and paperwork, you essentially work through a, through a portal um, or you can actually interface with the provider through their API uh, using pro programs that you have for network management or your own CRM or whatever. Um, our network is both service data center and fiber neutral. We build to everywhere on our own optical fiber. So what we propose is a new carrier network architecture. It's not an overlay. On our optical network, we build ethernet connectivity for you on demand that you essentially summon an interface with either through our API or through our web portal. We provide layer two and layer three services that are highly resilient. And we've got a ton of capacity in our fabric, over 50 terabits per second. I think it might even be more as we've been building out. What it doesn't say on this slide is how we do it. And essentially the how is that we own our whole software stack. We own the OSS and the BSS. And so we can instantiate new services, change the way we build for things uh, based on user demand. An example of what an API un driven underlay provides versus traditional telco provisioning is, is actually in the time to provision. What used to take days, maybe months to provision by a traditional telco now takes minutes on a uh, network as a service offering. When I say it's API first, every part of our, of, of our operation is instantiated as an API. So our portal is the instantiation of our API. Uh, and that means that for you, you can integrate our services with your existing workflows, whether that's network management, a service desk workflow, uh, a DevOps workflow, uh, or CRM integration. And that's the power of API integration is I can integrate with you very easily, and I can integrate with other providers uh, very easily as well. So that software platform and the hardware that we use to build our network allow us to offer a diverse set of connectivity services. And we're always adding more. We offer point-to-point -point connectivity, which can connect your co-location facilities um, across continents. Uh, you can build a global backbone using it uh, from one, one area to another in our fabric. It provides hybrid cloud connectivity. So you can move workloads between private clouds that you have instantiated in your private data centers or in a colo facility to a public cloud. And we connect with over 15 different cloud providers, including the major ones, Amazon, Azure, and Google. Uh, we offer multi-cloud routing, and that's a very interesting application. You can instantly connect major cloud providers, and a lot of uh, enterprises now have more than one provider, and that was part of uh, the performance demonstration that I showed you earlier. You don't even have to have a port on our network uh, in order for that to happen. You can connect one to the other, Google to Azure, AWS to Azure, over our fabric without having physical hardware connected. 
And we offer really any to any to allow you to build a custom new network to connect with inner exchange providers that are uh, our partners on our fabric or uh, internet transit providers that are on our fabric as well. So you can reinstantiate your enterprise network on network as a service fabric. And that leads us to demo time. I'm probably wondering what that looks like. I'm gonna switch really quickly here. I don't wanna, it, it's almost impossible to show you everything that you could see in the portal that uh, helps you discover our network, but I'll do my best just to give you a couple of simple examples. Starting with the login, this is how you interface with the network. Um, uh, we support single sign on if you want, but I'm just gonna log in simply here. When you first uh, uh, come into the portal, you can see there's a lot of different things to kind of consume visually. Um, front and center is creating new services. And I'm gonna show you how to create an interface on our fabric. Uh, and along the side, again, you, you have uh, highlighted some of the services that we offer as well and how you interface with them. But let me jump right in with creating an interface or what it looks like to create an interface in our portal. So the, the first thing that you notice is that uh, we have a lot of locations and luckily these are searchable. I can literally search for something like London, if I can type correctly. Oops, didn't spell right. And you can see it starts to bring up uh, sites that are in the greater London area so you can search better. And you can see also an interesting thing here that I'll just mention as a side note is uh, some of these, uh, these locations actually have Colt on them. We are integrated with Colt's network in Europe. So uh, the, what, the way the way our portal operates on our own network also exposes similar services inside of Colt's network. I'm going to pick uh, someplace local. Let me let me let me say uh, let's do Los Angeles, and I'll just pick Core Site in Los Angeles just as an example. So when I come up, I can pick uh, port details starting with the speed, and you can see here that we show. Uh, uh, four different uh, service offerings there as far as the speed of your connection. If you don't see one, it just means that that inventory is out and there's a place in the portal where you can request if you want that specific inventory in that site. And we're just gonna request one gigabit per second here. And then you can see there's a place for me to select the optic. In this case, I really don't have a lot of choice. So I'm gonna use the LX optic. The next thing is uh, availability zone. So we offer high availability within our fabric. Uh, but for your termination point, if you're worried about the high availability of the gear that you're actually terminating in, we offer you two different termination points within the facility. So you can create redundant connectivity if you want to. I'm just going to pick a zone here. I'm going to give the port a description. I'm just going to make sure that I remember that this is a demo port and that I put it in place. I remember to take it down later. Um, and then I can select my term. And you see here that the port can be essentially uh, leased on a month to month basis or all the way up to 36 months if I want to. If I pick month to month, uh, you can see that it, it generates a quote for the service uh, here in the little green box. If I change the term, you can see that there's discounts essentially uh, for longer term commitments. This is different than a telco um, in, in many ways, if you ever interfaced with them. I'm just going to set it for month to month. You see there's a button here that allows me to schedule a provision date. So I can pre-provision this for, for instantiation in the future if I want to. But I'm going to go ahead and place my order. And that's going to essentially uh, start the, the process of provisioning that port. Now, you can see I already have two other ports that are provisioned here. Uh, let me show you something about the way those ports work while this one's in, in, uh, in provisioning. You can see it's already progressing 60% provision. 
some of the actions you can take here to deal with a cross connect between that port on the fabric and your network, whether it's in the cloud or whether it's in a private data center or a co-location space. Uh, and so uh, there's two ways that you can get that cross connected. You can generate a letter of authorization automatically, and it's going to do this for it and just allow it to, uh, it'll download it to my computer. Um, and I can give that to the provider on premise and they will connect uh, uh, to the packet fabric port that was allocated for you. On the other hand, uh, you can provide me with a letter of authorization uh, to connect to your equipment and uh, Packet Fabric can do that for you. And we have a place over here on the side under cross connects that allows you to upload to me your letter of authorization from that provider. Differences in uh, essentially uh, who's doing the work for you and, and who bills you. Another one of the things that you can see uh, about uh, uh, these uh, individual ports is that you can renew them. We have online renewals as well, uh, if your contract term is up. So you literally can do everything through the portal. So while it's provisioning and it says it's, it's there now, as a matter of fact, it's telling me that it's up, but uh, I need to do the cross connect. I'm gonna take a look over at what it takes to just create a virtual connection uh, between two ports. So I'm going to create a virtual circuit. And you can see there's a number of different endpoints to which I can create a virtual circuit. I, I mentioned earlier, you can build your own network. I can connect you to an inner exchange partner um, or an internet access provider if you wanted to. And there's a number of marketplace clouds that you can go to and connect to. But I'm just going to connect point to point. I'm going to connect to myself across the backbone. I'm going to pick a starting point, and uh, I'll make that uh, here in Atlanta. And I'll pick a destination port, which is Chicago. Again, I'll fill in uh, a name for the circuit as well. Uh, but right now, I have a choice in how I want to be built for the circuit. So I can be billed hourly if I want to. I can be billed for usage, uh, usage-based billing, if you'd like to, by the gigabit byte, essentially. Or I can do a dedicated term. And I'm going to pick uh, the dedicated term because I wanted to show you something that happens when you use dedicated term as well. And I'm just going to say I'm going to go month to month. Again, the same thing applies as to the port. I, the, if I pick a longer term and, and commit to a longer term, I can get a, a, a lower rate going to select the speed of the virtual circuit and I'm just going to connect at 100 megabits per second. That's that's not that much, but we'll just create the connection anyway. And then I'm going to, uh, I'll keep the VC description they have. Now there's a bunch of things here with assigning a virtual LAN ID uh, to the circuit. And that's not automatically, uh, essentially I can pick the next available one. I'm starting at four because these were new ports. There's also advanced configuration options down here. If you wanna control all of that, I'm not gonna open it up, but you can literally control all of the layer two settings that you want there, uh, tag application and that sort of stuff. But I'm, I'm satisfied with that. And you can see what my, my quote is essentially for, for that circuit. I'm just gonna go ahead and place that order. The request is dispatched. It comes through and you, you can see how quickly it's going to instantiate itself. So while it's doing that, um, we'll look at a couple other places that you can go. If I wanted to, I can go to what they call a hosted cloud connection. Now, hosted cloud connections are essentially um, a shared connection to the cloud. The thing that's really nice about that is uh, uh, you don't have to pay for a cross connect. We've already done that for you. And you can see that there's a number of different, uh, there you can go, there's my, my virtual circuit is now up. Um, if I want to go to hosted cloud, essentially I can pick in any one of the, the cloud providers that um, I want to go to, pick a location like I did before, the same sort of, of operation uh, works. I can potentially pick AWS where I want to go from, uh, maybe Atlanta, I can choose the on-ramp and speed. And this will be done just as fast as that virtual circuit was done. And then I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, um, but I wanted to accentuate the difference between that and dedicated cloud. 
If you did dedicated cloud, that would be your own private port on the fabric to the cloud provider. And you would go through the same port setup type of arrangement that you did uh, before um, when you were setting up a port, including the, the letter of authorization and the handoff to have the cross connect run for you. So I'm gonna stop the demo at that point, just to, that's probably enough just to give you an idea of what's possible inside of our fabric and how quickly everything works. I'm gonna switch back. And I think we're at the point for Q&A. Okay, Ken, thank you very much. That's a lot of information, <laughs> I gotta say that. Um, just curious, does uh, Network as a Service help with or compete with SD-WAN? It actually kind of helps with. Um, uh, the vision would be that uh, on the back on the back end of your SD-WAN concentrator that you would have private connectivity uh, uh, to your cloud or to your private data center or your co-location space. But again, it not only lowers the cost, particularly if you're going to public cloud, um, it also guarantees the performance of the applications like I illustrated in this slide. Okay. Um, we have a question about security. Can, can you discuss some more of the security features? Well, it is a private network. Um, so you're isolated from the internet. You are isolated from the other customers within it. We don't have um, a security service like you get from a firewall that's at the edge in your SD-WAN concentrator or SASE service. We interface with those. So you can go through whatever security service that you like or whatever security partner that you like and still use our fabric. Okay. Um, you showed us the uh, different uh, uh, clouds. So to which cloud providers does Packet Fabric connect customers? All of them or specifically? We, we connect to all uh, and in, in our geography uh, to all of them. We, we, we don't have an affinity or an affiliation with any one public cloud provider. And the same thing with uh, co-location providers as well. Okay, all right. So um, can you describe what makes Packet Fabric different as a network, network as a service provider? Well, for one thing, we own our own network. We're not an overlay over somebody else's network, which a lot of our competitors are. Uh, the second is that we do own, our all, own all of our own software. So when we go to partner or uh, work with an enterprise, we know what's possible. We know exactly what it takes to integrate with somebody else because we control all of our own software. So we know just how much work it is when we look at your software. Um, and I think that's really one of the reasons why I came to work at Packet Fabric is that it is as close to a cloud-like service as I've seen, where we own our, own, own our own software, have our own developers, and are constantly developing the product. Um, as you and I had talked about, I think a little earlier before the conference, we push software just like cloud providers push software for their services um, transparently to our customers, adding new features and uh, doing maintenance all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, where and when should customers consider network as a service versus um, internet connectivity? Hmm. Well, I mean, because I work for the network as a service provider, I'd say always. But but in in <laughs> in reality, VPN connectivity does have a place, particularly. Uh, uh, for lower speed connectivity. And again, if you're not moving a lot of data, the egress data costs don't, uh, don't come and bite you as hard. Uh, but in general, if you're going to be moving even a, a reasonable amount of data, and we could talk about how much that is because we've done some analysis on it, the costs start to make private just makes sense. And the security of being on a private network and off of the internet and the performance itself just kind of help make applications pop. And what we're seeing a lot is that uh, as people move into hybrid and multi-cloud, they move a lot of data monthly between their private cloud and their public cloud and back, um, and between some of their edge resources as well. Customers are storing data all over the place. Um, and those flows essentially uh, can be quite pricey if you're paying by the byte. Um, 
And the applications that rely on accessing that data, for instance, if you're accessing data remotely using an analysis program, you want the performance to really work for you. You, you really do need the performance of a private network. I see. Okay. Now, is there a way to get uh, last mile transport directly connected to network as a service? Um, certainly, we work with a number of different providers on, on how to make that happen for you. And if you have that request, uh, a lot like other fabric providers, we're, we're willing to discuss that with you and work that out with your provider. We're currently working with a, a couple of different providers to be able to provide uh, uh, integrated last mile access, but the integration step is still a ways away for us. But, okay. but it is... Yeah a goal of ours to be able to provide end-to-end -end connectivity for you. All right, great. Uh, finally, Ken, would you like to remind our attendees how they can reach Packet Fabric for more information? Um, uh, through our website, more than uh, anything else. I don't know. Uh, we had some in, in the, I think in the slide, there you go. Um, you can, there's a number of materials that we provided. I encourage people to look, for instance, at the cloud router uh, 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 info paper that we've done because it's really kind of interesting. A lot of people don't know that you can actually do uh, public cloud routing between your two public clouds without actually having a port on Packet Fabric. Um, so it's an interesting service there, like I said. We have uh, materials on Agile data center interconnection, as you can see there. And of course, uh, through sales at Packet Fabric, through, through email or through our website. All right, great. Before we go though, I want to remind you that registration for Channel Vision Magazine's CBX Expo 2022 is open. So come join the entire Channel Vision Magazine team in the desert, November 2nd through 4th at the Talking Stick Resort and Casino in Scottsdale, Arizona. For information and registration, go to our website, channelvisionmag.com. And while you are there, remember, you'll be able to access this webinar and all other Channel Vision presentations, including CBTV and podcast interviews on demand. And that's going to do it for our webinar. I'd like to thank Packet Fabrics Tech Lead for Strategy, Ken Gray, for his presentation. From all of us at Channel Vision Magazine, from Ken and our friends at Packet Fabric, thanks for attending and have a safe and prosperous day.